Okay, so my name is Dan Morrill, and I'm going to kind of talk about what you need to be aware of social media wise when you're going and looking for a job. One of the first things that any good HR person is going to do, regardless of what company policy says, they're going to Google your name, they're going to Google your email address. Right? This is just a de facto. It doesn't matter if company policy says you shouldn't do this. But it's a lot like running a background check on you guys now. Right? And it's because we've turned ourselves into public people. Whenever we post on Facebook, we are a public person. Right? So we're exposing cool things that we do with our life. Now the really good part about me is that I actually have what's called a Google Ganger. Right? And that means there are other people with my exact name and part of Google and part of how it works. So one of the things that would really, really make me happy is if someone confused me with Dan Morrill down here in Mountain View, who works on the Android security team keeping all your Android phones safe. Right? I would truly love to be confused with this person. The only problem is he's in Mountain View, I'm in Seattle. The good part is that people often get us confused, so I get requests to speak about Android security and he gets requests to teach classes. Makes <laughs> it makes for a really interesting day. But you can see there's a huge difference between him and what he does. But sometimes these confusion things will matter, right? So if you're up there and you're on the network and there's a felon with your name who pops first in Google searching, they're gonna confuse you all the time. So you have to make sure that when you're going in and they say is that there are other people on the, on the network that have similar names to mine, so make sure you're really looking at the right person when you go through and you take a look at me. Ideally, when you go in and you take a look at social media, you should have your privacy settings set to this, right? Absolutely dead bang quiet. So content is generally unavailable. The only people that can see my Facebook account are my 1,247 friends. Do I really have 1,247 friends? Yes, and Facebook. Do I know them all? No, not a clue, because we collect people. Ideally, you'd have a picture involved so they can go, oh, nope, that's not the right, no, he doesn't work at LinkedIn. Oh, this is the guy. Yeah, kind of looks like me, doesn't it? Not so scruffy, though. I think I must have shaved recently for that picture. But then here's the other Dan Morrill. My doppelganger is actually really kind of fun. We've actually met a couple of times. He is absolutely as bizarre as I am, which is really cool. I can see why people get as confused, right? So you have to sign in to get all this stuff going. But the idea is go through and look at your profiles without signing in. So you can see what other people see. That's the first step. Go through and do things so that other people see what you see. Ideally, again, you'd see stuff like this, but then you have friends, right? And your friends like to share things. And they love to share things that are off. And again, oh, I lost a friend. 1,246, so I lost a friend in the last hour or two, which is really kind of interesting. But we take a look at our friends and we talk about the things that we're involved with, right? So if you take a look at this profile, you take a look at this profile, and you take a look at this profile, you're gonna think I'm actually three people rolled into one, right? So I'm one better than the old god Janus, which had the dual heads on it. I actually have three brains now. Makes me super smart. But it's that whole idea, right? What you put out on the internet is exactly what your potential employer is going to see. So if you have naked pictures of you, up. I have some modeling friends. The first question that they get asked at an interview is, are there any naked pictures of you on the internet? Because if there are, you're not getting the job. Period. Done with that. The other thing that I really, really love about being on the internet is, are you drinking? What happens if you work for a company that has decided to ban people from drinking or smoking, right? Because companies can lay those ground rules out. If you go work for a very conservative, Christian-oriented company, they're going to want to see nothing but happy families. So if you're me, and you take a bunch of pictures, because I also am a professional photographer, you may see things like girls in latex and cases, right? So my very Christian conservative co company is not going to hire me based on that one picture alone, right? Are you smoking dope? Are you talking about doing a bowl, <laughs> right? We get these things. We know these things as hiring managers. We go, oh, he's smoking a bowl, so that means he smokes dope, and he wants to be a forklift operator in my warehouse. Oh, that's a bad idea, because then they end up on YouTube as part of the funny jokes where people are driving forklifts into big, gigantic warehouses full of stuff 
and knocking over the shelves. Right? Honestly, this is what employers actually think about when you kind of go through this. Oh, he's into urban exploration. Well, what happens if he's driving around in the middle of an underground tunnel and the tunnel caves in? Maybe I should get dead peasant insurance on him. Everybody know what dead peasant insurance is? That's when the company takes out insurance on your life. So they get the insurance benefits, not necessarily you or your spouse or your designated other. Right? So if you live a risky life, if you do risky things like, like climbing around underground Seattle, well, I may hire you just so I can put a million dollar policy on you and you're going to get stuck in a cave in somewhere and I'm going to make a million bucks real quickly off of you. Right? <clears throat> Wants to dress as a sock monkey, huh? Well, that's a little odd. Why would anybody want to get a dull sock monkey costume? Right? Anything that's out of the ordinary, anything that's out of the out of the norm, and then my friend comes along. Ooh, this screams a B horror movie. Let's go make one. <laughs> How many people want to go be star in a B horror movie? Right? Maybe not. Right? Oh, hey, broken glass. Sunday hijinks. Oh, Sunday hijinks. Broken glass. Wow. What was he doing? Was he breaking windows in a building? Ooh, that could be bad. Do I want someone who's got a anger management issue? See how we can start saying all sorts of horrible things about that person just based on one little itty bit of the social profile? Then this gets more entertaining because I have three. Right? Now, you notice the difference, right? Facebook is more friends, family, crazy stuff, right? Crazy things I do sock monkeys, puppets, girls in display cases, a little odd. Oh, but here he is over here on G Plus talking about installing Oracle Grid Engine on a virtual machine. Ooh, that looks kind of cool. Oh, and then he starts reading about pirate comic books. Oh my God, he's a comic book geek. Oh man, does that mean he like goes to comic book stores that are like all dungeony? Does he like girls? Right. So you got to think about it. Oh, there's our girl in the latex case again. Oh, a place called Damn Interesting. Legitimately fascinating information. Wow. What's their propaganda value? What are they right wing? Are they left wing? Do they meet with the core company values? Right? Oh gosh, he was out at Fairy Con. You know, those people are really kind of weird because they all dress around in big fairy costumes, big minotaur costumes with big headpieces. Right? So we may not want to hire this guy. Right? Because he's way outside the norm. He is not a mainstream American. He does things. They're a little odd. Right? And he has this thing about Tooth Fairy. Oh, and a Human 1.0 hotfix patch. Really? Memory patch leaked. Should fix enter room and forget why. Enter and item for misplaced items. So he's kind of absent minded. Huh? Again, a little odd. Right? But then you get into my LinkedIn. Now, my LinkedIn is actually what I use as a resume. Right? I do know that there's stuff out there on Facebook, which is why if you don't know me, you ain't getting it. G plus, a little bit more staid, a little bit more mainstream. Still a little odd though. But really what I want to do is I want to send people to LinkedIn. All right, you have to know which one you're going for. But the LinkedIn profile is really more about what I want an employer to see. All right, so it's all information security all the time. It talks about lose sec. It talks about what I'm doing, how I am what I think I'm up to. And the even better part about this, the even better part about this, is I have recommendations from people that I worked with in the past. These recommendations are priceless. I've actually used these to obtain employment. Right? So better than keeping a list of references, I said, you just go talk to people that worked with me before on LinkedIn. Right? Because the only ones you're going to see up here are the ones that these are truly people that I really love and I'd love to work with them. Right? And they will always speak good things of me because we left on really good terms. She still works there. He doesn't. He actually works at a venture capital company. So if I'm going and working with a startup, they're going to love this connection. So I do a lot of consulting work on the outside. So when you see that, when you see this, he works for the Xeno Society. They're going to go, oh, wow. He's got access to the VC community, so he may be really valuable to us as an employee. He knows security, and he's got friends in the biz. Right? Oh, he's worked with a bunch of other people. Startup weekend? Good. See how I kind of portray this one out? I want to be in a smart, agile, smart startup. Right? I want to be working with people that are 
inventing the technology you will use two or three years from now. So I very carefully control the LinkedIn profile. And that's really where I want to send people off to. All right, security architect, this is my old boss, Lori Lear. There's nothing better than having a boss write you a recommendation. Absolutely nothing better. Sherry D. Kaiser was my project manager. And she was absolutely cool. So these two people actually manage the work that I would do on a daily basis. So go talk to them. They're really kind of neat. But then you'll notice that as we go back in time. How do you get your former employers to post on your LinkedIn? Um, I actually ask them. I say, Lori, would you be willing to give me a recommendation? Right? And if she gives me a bad recommendation, I can make that invisible. <laughs> Honestly, you can very carefully control your LinkedIn profile and who can do what with you, right? So if I have a bad recommendation from Pete, may he burn forever in Hades, uh, <laughs> lazy, good for nothing, oh my God, why? <laughs> Should never have hired him in the first place. You know, we do have those things, people that we don't click with, people that are going to say bad things about you. Right? You can bury them on LinkedIn by making them not visible on your timeline. And they go into this nice little black hole somewhere where no one ever sees them. So you can control your message here a lot better than you can on Google Plus or on Facebook. How many people have been involved, went to a nice stayed party, and you stayed downstairs, you didn't go upstairs, you didn't go down in the basement, you played Parcheesi all night, and someone started tagging pictures of you all over the place for being at this party. Anybody ever have that happen? Wild, drunken, booze-ups, and all the rest of it were going down in the basement you had no part of? No, no one's ever been to a wild, drunken party. Ever. <laughs> in their entire life. It's not in my Facebook profile. God, not in your Facebook profile, right? So you can, you can bury things a lot better on LinkedIn than you can on anything else. And again, it kind of goes back a little bit and talks about the languages I speak. And then this is the even better part. These are people that have endorsed me for doing certain things for them in the past. You'll notice that if I am an employer and I'm trying to hire Dan for project management, wow, okay, he's maybe not a project manager. But boy, if I have a cloud, uh, cloud computing job or a security job, then yeah, this is the guy I'm going to want to hire. Because he's been endorsed by 20 people that says, yeah, I may know something about cloud computing. It may be invaluable, right? These are not sponsored endorsements. These are people saying, yeah, I worked with him on this project. And he said, yeah, this is really, really cool. So if you have friends, right, most endorsed for, endorse your friends on what you think their skills are. This will pay off in spades when you're doing the social networking part portion of your job search, right? Honest to God. If, and you can go back and actually check and see. You can actually go and pull this person up. Right? So KBTC, wow, what does KBTC do with cloud computing? I'd have to kill you if I told you. <laughs> right? But that was a really fun project. And Ed had a good time, and I had a good time, and we did really cool stuff. Right? So they'll go back and they'll talk to Ed, right? Because he is the director of development over at KBTC. You can also go back and talk to other people like Chris Schreier. He's actually one of my ex students. But the cool part of him being an ex-student, he actually sat through one of my long, boring lectures on cloud computing, right? And he actually got employment because of that class, which I thought was really kind of sweet to see. And again, when you have people that come along, Charles keeps on popping up. Charles is probably one of my most valuable contacts. I've known Charles for almost five years now, right? I know his grandchildren kind of contact, right? We both endorse each other heartily over what we do, right? You find a couple of people that are willing to take that on, and you have a gold mine of linking and support and everything else you can go along with. Plus, he's also really handy because he works in the startup community. So he knows that if there's a startup that needs this particular task, he'll send that over to me. And the good part is my charge rate's about $250 an hour. I like those kind of jobs. <laughs> All right? Dan also knows about, so if you're looking for a Flash developer, I'm probably not your guy. Uh, looking for software project management, e-commerce, web development, well, I'm really not your person, right? But people will look at these and go, okay, this is where I want them to be, cloud computing and security. Those are his two top ones, All right? Project management, uh-oh, it's down 3% year over year for the year in terms of people hiring. This is why this is also handy, right? You hover that tag over words, and you can see how that industry is doing as far as LinkedIn is concerned, right? So if you see cloud computing is up 28% year over year, it has been a really lucrative skill for me to have learned. Yes, sir. So then, uh, can you also add in here uh, 
portfolio of what you've done, maybe white papers that you've created would, and that kind of stuff? I would recommend that if you decide to do a portfolio and things like that, you have to be really, really, really aware of what the copyright of that is going to be. What if it's your own creation? Like if it's your own creation and you've had it spell checked and you've had an editor go over it and you've had it looked at and read by other people that are your peers in that particular industry, then by all means, yes, go ahead and put it on LinkedIn. If you just wrote something for the fun of it, it may not be professional enough. Writing, when you're doing writing like that, there's a very different quality bar over, say, blogging or over, say, a Facebook entry. Fun party. Consequences of going to fun parties with a bunch of typos and spelling errors. The ramifications of drinking too much at a fun party in the basement as done by blah 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 with a nice long tables and all the rest of it. So you really want to make sure that you're writing to the particular level that you want to be at. Right? Alright. Says I'm generally approachable, listen willing to listen to most ideas, all the rest of it. And kind of see where are the other recommendations I've got. Um, I've received seven, right? And you'll notice that Pete is not on here. I love Pete to death. He was in a really bad mood that day. <laughs> right? And then all the rest of it. And then my connections. So Pete Anthony. Right? I love him to death. Bad day. I can bury it. Thank you. Alright. If I have to, I can go ahead and modify it. The other thing that makes this really handy too is that when you get into groups, right? So if I'm going to be a security person, I want to be part of the boards that work on security on LinkedIn. Simple as that. I want to interact with them. Because then employers can go see if I'm really cutting it or not. Right? Because if I talk about you should secure SSL, right, and we talk about using invalid or bad keys, if we pull a Windows Azure and knock out half of the service because of an expired SSL certificate, and I think that's okay, then you know not to hire me. Right? So these groups that you work with are really truly important for setting up a person. Right? You'll notice that there's also some follow over from comic book business and all the rest of it. Um, Highline doesn't really have a group, so I'm not part of Highline's group. Highline needs to make a group in LinkedIn. Yes. You also need to endorse me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can endorse you back. There you go. Right? And again, there's that trade-off, uh -huh. right? Amelia is my manager. We've known each other, what, two and a half years? Almost three? Four years. Four years? So we know each other well enough now, we know everyone's strengths and weaknesses, so we can write a really good review for that person, right? And there's no harm in asking your friends to write you a review, especially if they've worked with you in class, especially if they've worked with you on projects, especially if we hear little tinkling bells in the background, it sounded really kind of odd, <laughs> right? And again, it's that whole idea, and who am I following, right? This makes a difference too, companies, groups, where am I getting my news from? So your LinkedIn profile is really your modern day resume with a whole lot more interactivity that goes along with it. It's not a static one, two, or three page resume. It's something really kind of important as you start putting all this stuff together in terms of how you want to portray yourself to the greater world, right? Again, you are now public people. We can have all the wonderful debates about privacy that you want to have. The fact is, and that the last nine out of ten people to contact me for a job have been through LinkedIn. Honestly, this is where I get the majority of really interesting job offers or companies to go look at. Right, is on LinkedIn. Thank God they can't get to my Facebook profile because they may not want to hire me. <laughs> and this is a real issue, right? How do you separate your friends and family? Well, the really, really cool part is that while this is against Facebook's terms of service, you can have a public profile and your family profile, right? Even though it says you can't do this, make a public profile, make a professional profile on Facebook. So they go to your professional profile, give that one out, talk about your cool job, talk about the cool things you do, talk about your cool research, and keep your family and friends over here. Don't let your family and friends know you have a separate profile over here, otherwise they're going to be tagging, tagging you in pictures of that night in Mexico in Boys Town and you don't remember any of it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> to be real dead honest, have to. Now one of the things I also want to talk about too is employers. If they ask you for your Facebook username and password, you can say no. 
And the argument that I really honestly believe that more people should, should say is that in Section 4A of Facebook's Terms of Service, it says, thou shalt not share the, thy username and password, right? So because of Lori Drew back in the MySpace days, violating in Terms of Service is actually a felony. And as done up by the latest incident with Aaron Schwartz, the young gentleman that violated MIT's Terms of Service to LC Server and downloaded a couple four or five million articles, right? It is a felony. You can go to jail for many, many years unless you decide to off yourself. Not a good choice. Either way you go. So if your company is asking you to commit a felony, is this a company you want to go work for? Right? Honestly. Because some of these prosecutors get that little chomp in their in their bit, and they'll go, "You violated terms of service." It is a man. It is a mandatory sentencing kind of thing. It's a lot of money, and it's not a fun kind of jail. It's not a jail. It's actually a prison system that you go into. Right? It's not going to be a good time. So if your company that you're that wants your username and password, explain to them the whole felony concept, and then ask them why they're asking you to commit a felony before you even got on board because by then the interview is over with you do not want to go work for them at all for any love nor form because if they're asking you to do this before you even come on board what's it like on the inside what are their ethics right and this is a real big clue that this may not be something you want to go do or a company you may want to go work for so it kind of makes sense and it's a fun argument to have with human resources I absolutely adore that part of the interview it is my favorite as part of the interview. If they ask me for my username and password, and they've only done that once, just once, and I ask them, why would you want me to commit a felony before I even start with the company? Shouldn't we wait till afterwards? <laughs> and, you, and you watch the human resources person just drop, because they don't get it. They don't understand. They just are following a script, a human resources script. They don't understand that violating terms of service, blah, blah. Then you can start going in and waxing poetic about Lori Drew and Aaron Schwartz and a couple of other people about how they did the same thing. You know, one of them, three of them killed themselves. One of them went to jail and then appeals and it cost them millions of dollars. And we don't even know each other that well. So kind of an interesting process. If a government agency asks you for that, that is actually against federal law right now. There is actually just passed clean about six months ago. It is illegal for a federal agency to ask you for your username and password. Right? Montana tried to do that for about six months and got ripped apart on the internet and they dropped it. Oh no, we weren't doing that. So you do have some rights when you go in there, right? About how you use your data, who gets to, to use it. In the meantime, Facebook's making money off of you, right? But go through your Facebook profile, delete anything that's drinking, smoking dope, anything that doesn't meet a mainstream American criteria. Use that as your professional profile. Hive your friends out. If your friends are, are doing drugs, drinking, partying all night long, wear the little horse head, driving the car kind of thing, right? Make sure that they're gone from that profile that you hand to your employer, right? Have a different one. Be with your friends. Do crazy things. That's cool, but make sure your employer only has access to that profile that's your public site, right? Same thing with Google Plus. The only problem with Google Plus is what? Real names. So if people get all confused about who's who, pray that you have a Google Ginger that works down at Android and Google Plex itself, and people will get too confused. <laughs> right. So it kind of makes sense on why you want to have an absolutely clean social profile before you get started. Right? So these guys are going to talk to you about building a resume. Before you go build the resume, clean your social profile up, honestly, right? because that is your face to the world. That is you standing on the corner of Second and Pike with a bullhorn going, hey, notice me! All right, any questions? You guys good? Good. Happy? Yeah. Thank Can you, Dan. All right. which is a computer consulting company. We've been around for many, many, many years, and we do a heck of a lot of interviewing. So I'm on the boring part of this. Oh, thank you. If ever, okay. I'm doing the boring part. He got the most interesting part. Um, I brought along something that I wrote some time ago, 
and it gives you guidelines on how to improve your resume and make it more effective. But the speech today is going to be centered on just a basic structure of a resume, not guidelines. I'm assuming you don't really know anything. So um, your resume is normally going to have an introduction, something that tells about yourself, something that tells about your education, a technical section, employment history, and then a catch-all, miscellaneous. Thanks. Oh, you're going to do this for me? You're so sweet. Thank you. OK. You saw my social profile. Darn straight. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're not going to hire me otherwise. <laughs> OK. The first part, a lot of times people will put an objective on their resume, what they want to do. I recommend not doing that. You limit yourself with your objective. When you're sending your resume into some place, they know what you want to do. You want to do the job you just applied for. Um, if you say, I want to be a project manager in five years, a company that thinks, I might not be able to let that person be a project manager, we don't have that kind of growth potential here, may not even bring you in for an interview. And that's not what you want. You need that first five years of experience to get to the point where you could be a project manager, maybe not here, but someplace. You want the opportunity to turn the job down. So your objective here is get in the door, get in front of the manager. One thing I'm going to stress through this whole conversation is you need to spend a lot of time thinking about yourself before you ever sit down to do your resume. You need to think about what you've done in a career, in school, in, social, in your social life that you're really proud of. What were your successes? And then you need to think about, why was I successful? What it is it about me that makes me good at that? Because these are the things you need to bring out in your resume so that people who look at it say, I want to talk to this person. They have not only have done the job, but they've done it well. And they've shown me how they've done it well. So in your summary, you're going to talk about what you think you're good at and why you think you're good at it. Um, Next one. So here are some examples. I put together a couple examples from resumes that I saw that I thought had good one. A motivated, organized professional with strong educational education in administrative and operations support, data management, data analysis, a critical thinker, a resourceful and results-driven individual with strong communication skills, a passion to help people, and ability to deliver solutions to challenging problems. So that person has talked about what they do well and why they're good at what they do. And here's another one. Um, this one, they're proficient in network administration, user support, able to work well unsupervised. And then they talk about what they do, multilingual, what they can do, strong sense of responsibility, always open to new knowledge and experience. So those are things that will make an employer look at them beyond just what you have done, but why they might want to bring you in to their group, because they need somebody who lives, eats, breathes technology. And if it comes out in the resume, it'll make them much more interested in talking to you. Now, education, you're all doing this right now, so clearly this is really important. Um, your concentration, your GPA, I'd say put it on there if it's over a 28. Otherwise, leave it off. Um, the courses that you think are relevant to the job that you're looking at. And then if your school has some kind of a program that's particularly well known, if they have some policies that help you as a student, bring it out. When you sell your school, you sell yourself. So I have some examples next. So here's somebody, college. Concentration, GPA, a little bit of information about what they did on their own because they learned a lot outside of school and were able to uh, make it pay in school. The courses that they took, and the next one. And this person, I thought, did a really good job of talking about the, the program that they were in. Business Intelligence Master's Program is an intensive, hands-on, project-oriented program where participants gain knowledge and valuable experience putting the business intelligence skill set to use in a simulated work environment. That sells what they just did in school. OK, technical. 
if you are in a technical program you need your technical to show up all over the place most of the search engines that are used today they'll decide that you have more experience if you list the skill more than once may not be true but that means that you want a technical section that shows all the tools that you've used and then probably under every single work history you'll put there separately the same tools the tools that you used in that job the, okay so and then oh the other thing on this too is don't limit yourself um, to just the things you've taken in school if you started learning something on your own and you think you know it relatively well put it on your resume if you've done it as a volunteer, put it on your resume. Make sure that that skill shows up. So here's an example from somebody's resume of the tools that they used. And then they put in some special skills too at the end of that, which I thought was good. And then there's one more next. And so here's another list of all the tools that somebody's used. Okay. Um, employment history should include anything that is work so it can be stuff you volunteered with things you did for your friends um, real work experience even if it was um, you know working in somebody's garden or babysitting or whatever all of this counts because you get good work skills out of this um, there are three ways you can put it together you can do reverse chronological which is most popular and loved by people who read resumes because they usually figure that the last job you had is going to be the most applicable to whatever you're doing. So, but you may not want to use reverse chronological because the, your most applicable skill might have been two jobs down. And you want the most applicable skill to show up on the first page of your resume, not on the second. Oftentimes people will never make it to the second page. So you want to be sure that on the first page you've got the job that you think is going to turn the key of, of getting you in for an interview with that client. Um, and functional is um, oftentimes used by people who have kind of spotty work history or it could be used by somebody who's done the same thing over and over and over again at, at various companies. So you'll put in a functional that shows what you did in general and then under that just list the jobs. Okay. The one thing on, on your employment history is just as in your summary, you want to talk not only about what you did, but what you did well, why you did it well, and quantify it. And you can quantify it not only by saying, I got this done fast, but by putting in quotes from your boss or from your teachers. If you were taking classes and what you're talking about here is classroom experience, and your teachers put some kind of a comment on your papers that was positive, quote them. Put it right in there. Okay, um, and here are some examples. Uh, web entry level web page developer, web developer. Um, the person talked about what they did and what it did for the company that they worked for. So they generated $30,000 from event registration from this particular web page they put together. Um, they increased traffic on the site. These are all things that somebody who reads it can go, yeah, they made a difference to that company, a real difference. I can, I can quantify it. So the next one. And this is um, the same thing, same person's resume. Um, more experience that they had. I just thought they did a, real, did a really good job of talking about what they did and how they did how they did well. Next one. And then um, here we go with a second person. This I liked because they took a lot of experience that wasn't really work experience, but they made work experience out of it. So they co-founded a software development club. club. They had a, their own personal re uh, website. Uh, they did work, and, and I think this goes on to a second page too. They prototyped an Android application. They were a student. Um, they talk about all the things that they've done, and that they were in the Army before that. Lead trainer for nine out of 24 months. Personally trained hundreds of soldiers, etc. 
So they've taken the experience that they had and they've made the best of it and showed shown what they might be able to do for a company. Even though none of this is real technology work experience, it's something that could interest an employer. Okay. And miscellaneous is whatever you didn't get in there, hobbies or associations, certifications that you've taken, or even if you've trained yourself to get certified but never got certified. Um, volunteer work that didn't make it onto the other page, any foreign languages that you have, any kind of skill set that might pique somebody's interest. Don't put on so much that people are going to think you don't have time for a job, but um, make sure that anything that's really of interest to you goes on. You never know. It may be of interest to the person who's doing the interview, and it may be the thing that makes them think they want to bring you in. Okay. That's it. That's all there is. Oh, but I did bring a couple of examples. Resumes. Pardon me? Yeah, I do. If you give me your email address, I'll give you my card. If you email me, I'll send you this. Uh huh. You're welcome. And um, here's a resume for somebody who's making a career change. And here's a resume. This one, I ended up a lot in here. Of somebody who's a recent graduate in technology and going out for their first job. Okay. And my card. And if you actually read that flyer, it has a lot of other things in it that I think are helpful, but not so general. Things like keeping yourself to one font style instead of lots of font styles making your borders clean, making the thing look pretty, look, um, be nice to look at. And the last thing I have to say is proofread your resume, please. Oh, drives me crazy when I see resumes come through and people have misspelled the COBOL or, you know, HTML or whatever. That is inexcusable. Mm. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Before you go the other way. No questions at all. If you have a gap in your work history and you're changing professions, how do you handle that on your resume with the last employer? Well, people do have gaps in their resumes, and um, <coughs> usually there's something, some kind of an explanation. You were in school. Um, you were making a decision about a career change, taking a sabbatical so that you could decide what you wanted to do, to do next. Um, it could be that there wasn't really a gap. There was something that you did during that period. But it's usually best just to put a little sentence in. It says, from this time to this time, I was doing this. Anybody? Any other questions? Oh, do me a favor while you guys are, are on here. Make sure your LinkedIn profile matches what's on the resume that you're building. Honestly, because if there's a discrepancy between the two, an employer will like tag on that to the exclusivity of everything else that's going on around you, right? So if your online resume does not match your resume in their database, make sure they at least match up 90% or better, right? That was something I was going to ask about. Um, arranging it according to the job that you're applying for. You know, like... Like, like the format? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm you're, that you build a resume for your job. Yeah. yeah, every time, every job you go for, you, you build a resume. Usually it's your name, all that kind of good stuff. Here, let me show you. Go do a real quick login here. Um, my resume is a little bit dated. This is going to be one of those times I'm actually going to get.
So now I gotta wait on AT&T to actually do something here. So. So while we wait for the code. <laughs> I would add, um, hi, I'm Matt Morton. I, um, I'm also the advisory committee for the consent department. I'll be here uh, after this, and I'd be happy to read any of your resumes. I have a red pen. Mm -hmm. Go over it at your discretion. Um, I will also be, if you'd like, I can stay later. I can stay a couple hours later today. So if somebody is going to be busy right after that, this it won't be available until 2 or 3 or so, let me know, and I'd be happy to stick around. show you my resume but right now we're kind of hooked up in that I have absolutely no uh, dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> didn't I just send you my resume a little while ago use this one. Wrong one. I desperately try to find a copy of my resume. You can tell how often I actually use my resume is because I don't generally. So I have a question for um, Marjorie and Dan. Well, mm -hmm. it, um, as you know, in many online forums, you don't want to give away your perhaps your full name, but you certainly don't want to give away your physical home address. And as you know, that collaborate collaborates with various other pieces of information that, that you don't want people to have. But at the same time, it's often expected that a resume contain your home address. Is there a way to balance that nowadays? What's the, is there a good approach about doing that, especially given that electronically submitted resumes end up in databases? Oftentimes people don't put their home address on a resume nowadays. They'll put an email address, uh, sometimes a telephone number, mm -hmm. sometimes just an email address so you can reach them. Okay. And then when you do your <clears throat> employment application, they'll collect all the other information. From sure. And that, that is a sensible time to collect where exactly you live. So. Okay, so this is my technical resume and I know I'm about to push this out onto YouTube with my phone number and my email attached. Um, I'm not one of those people that's going to necessarily care about that. And it's also because I am a public person, um, because I write a lot. Um, I do have people contact me at all hours of the day and night. Oh my God, we're all going to die. Um, I am personally one of the people that believes that privacy is a dead issue. Um, and it's mostly because I, I live out in the public world, right? So I don't really care if you have my phone number. Yes, I've had my fair share of stalkers, two of them in the last 10 years. They're entertaining when Mercer Island Police comes and picks them up at my condo front door. I love that when that happens. Um, King County Superior Court is absolutely brilliant about giving no contact orders in these instances. So I really, honestly, have kind of gone numb to that whole idea of privacy. Um, now, I broke one of the rules here, though, is because I have an objective, right? So if the objective thing is, is no longer good, and this resume is about two years old right now. So at that point two years ago, I really thought I'd make a good project manager. But then if you go and you look at my LinkedIn profile, I don't have very many endorsements for project managers. So <laughs> obviously, I don't like people enough to be a good, effective project manager. And that's probably a very true statement, right? I may want to, to be a thing. But my personality may be like scraping along 60 grit sandpaper. I may not make a good project manager because I have to be nice to people, right? Now, what I do have, though, is the skill set that we had pushed up there. Skills, Cisco, right? Cloud computing, Amazon Web Services, information security. All this stuff matches what's on my LinkedIn profile fairly accurately, right? Cisco doesn't show up anywhere on people endorsing me for Cisco, so I may want to drop that. 
right? But cloud computing, Amazon Web Services, the rest of it, oh, darn straight. This is starting to match up to what my friends have said I'm good at. Thank God they didn't say smoking a bowl and drinking as part of my endorsements on LinkedIn, right? Right? Professional experience, instructor, freelance researcher, right? So I've really kind of do a lot of freelance research for people and it's been an awful lot of fun, right? It gives me an opportunity to travel the world, which has been good. And then I was a program director at CityU. I did the reverse chronological. And the experience I'm doing now is the most important thing that I could be doing, right? Because I love researching security flaws in Amazon Web Services. And just alone in the class that we're teaching, we've discovered one really brilliant security flaw in Amazon Web Services that Amazon would have had no clue exists and how they manage keys between services and people. So that research paid off. It's a brilliant, brilliant paper that's gotten a lot of attention. Right? So I was a program director. I worked in education. Right? So ooh, program director, program manager, well, maybe not so much because people don't like my project management skills. <laughs> right? So I started moving this around, uh, VMC consultant. So I was working at Microsoft Game Studios for three years. That best job ever. If you ever get the chance to go work for Microsoft Game Studios, go. It is so much fun over there. It's an insanely good time, right? But that's exactly what an employer is going to want to hear too, is that here's this job, and I thought it was awesome, right? Can they match that energy and that creativity and that enthusiasm in their little staid company that I got when I was at Microsoft? Can they match that? The other thing an employer is going to look at is going to go, oh my gosh, it's all enterprise. He's only worked at really large companies. He's never worked at a small company of 20 people on his resume. Yeah? I have a silly question. Having created you know, my first resume several decades ago, and back then it was you wanted succinct sort of bulleted type, so is it now more acceptable to be using prose in your descriptions of things? What are people looking at when they're reading a resume? Well, a lot of people I work with really love to see the bullet, blah, 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 blah. Um, I like I like to see a mix. So I like to see, uh, because as I said, I want you to explain a little bit more about what you did, how you did it, and quantify it. And that's usually going to take a little paragraph for each one. So you may bullet each one of those, but yeah. Mix it up a yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I've been involved in academia way too long to be short of words. <laughs> so I tend to go for prose. I want you to know that I am awesome. And I'm going to show you how awesome I am by giving you a big, long block of text that's going to be too long, didn't read. Right? So we go through and we do this whole thing. I've gone back way too far. Right? I've gone all the way back to 1988, where I was a cryptologic person over in the Navy. So if a person's going to see cryptologic technician, what's the first thing you're going to think? Oh, my God, he's an egghead. He does math. How many people here love math? Anybody want to do the math for the RSA key with me? No? Darn. <laughs> Educational teaching. Where have I been? What have I done? How have I done it? Uh, what do you do about words that don't, that are in the popular lexicon but not in your spell checker? What do we do with words that, we, that are in the popular lexicon but not in the spell checker, like virtualization? Use them as they're, usually, as they're commonly used and forget about them not being in the spell checker. Okay. So that red line underneath that word is not going to no, tick you off. Good. <laughs> Yep, so that's a big thing. Um, publication history, this is really important for academia. It's also really handy for employers because they're gonna wanna know what you've done in a lot of ways, right? How have you proved your credentials? And one of the big things, especially if you're going into IT, if you're going into software programming, like Joel on software and all these other projects that you can be involved in, that's your publication history. If you've written code outside of this, classroom setting or outside of your job, that shows you're a participating member of the community and they can go back and take a look at your code quality. Oh, that's gold. That is absolute resume gold, right? So your publication history is any code you've written that's in the public domain, any documentation that you've written over really cool stuff that's in the popular domain. If you've written a blog entry on technology, that's gold. These are all good things because then you can go and see how you think. And employers love to know how you think, right? Um, if you have stuff that's a private report, so some of the things I wrote was for a private company, I'll still call it out, but I can't give you a copy of it, right? But I can still call it on my resume, but I want them to know that this was something I wrote that was a private research report, and it was really kind of cool. I can talk about it a little bit. Then the education that I've done, and then my member of places. So essentially, I've met your, your resume 
format and style just that horrible evil objective where I want to be a program manager and my LinkedIn skills don't quite match that. So maybe I should change my objective over to what my LinkedIn actually says to make it uh, harmonize a little bit better. I'll still dream of being a program manager. <laughs> so kind of does that help you see the actual resume even though it's a couple of years old and I do apologize for that. I really just use LinkedIn as my resume. So remember, if you just want to stalk me, there's my full address. <laughs> Knock yourselves out. Mercer Island Police are awesome. <laughs> so, Lordy, how far back is too far back? I figure somebody can normally go back 10 years, and you don't have to go back further than 10 years. You, should, you don't have to go back further than 10 years. You may want to reference it, you know, with a little line that says, prior to this, I was doing such and such. We have a lot of people, I think, that are worker retraining, coming back in. Yeah. So maybe they should use the skills that they got from those prior jobs as like a summary. Yeah. Something of that nature. Okay, you've got a question in back too. I, I think my question kind of piggybacks off that. If you if you switched careers, you know, and you spent ten years in, in some completely different industry, you know, how do you how do you account for that time? I mean, do you say that you yeah. Careers, or is there a, kind of a succinct way to say that? There still may be a lot of like leadership experience. Right. Years also. So you you probably learned something. <laughs> yeah. You probably gained some skills during that that are transferable. So I'd put in a paragraph that talks about what you did and what you gained out of it that might be helpful to your new to your, your new employer. And it shows you were employed. Right? Yes, right. and that take out. away the yeah. ability to let them fill in the words. Right. Right. And I was thinking it too, when we go through periods like we've been going through for the last few years, a lot of people go through prolonged periods of unemployment. And employers will recognize that. So when I go back and look at a resume from 2001, if there was a gap of a couple of years in there, it doesn't shock me and it doesn't bother me because I know what was going on with the economy during that period. We're going to probably be doing the same thing over the next few years. But it is good if you can show that you were trying to do something to get yourself retooled, get yourself studying, even if it's self-study, that you can put into the resume to show what you did during that period to get ready for employment again. Are there any other questions? Uh, go on. With your uh, resume, there's like about f what, five pages or something. Yes. Um, so you're talking about how they never get past normally the first page. How relevant is that putting all the information there? And what should you be putting on the first page? Well, I, I don't like page resumes that are five pages long. I think it's too long. I think you really want to try to keep yourself to three or fewer, re th three or fewer pages. The thing about the first page is you want them to want to keep on reading. There may be other things that they're going to learn about you that, that they would want to know, but you've got to get them to the second page and the third page, and they'll never get there unless you've captured their attention in the first page. So that's why you want your most important experience right there on page one. That'll drag them into page two. I was just going to say, I think that, that I'm not contradicting what she said I'm just adding to it because I think it really <coughs> depends on the industry that you're going to because like pharmaceutical sales loves brag books so if you're going to get into some companies they want more information so it really is going to depend upon the style and the culture of the company that you're applying to and what they like so even though it's true you know some people will tell you I went two or three we want description you know talk to the culture and the people that work there and figure out what they like because there's the one page bullets and I was asking her about the software that they use to scan your resume just it really depends on who you're applying to and find out that would be my suggestion because some of them are like this detail they want to know more about you so when you sit in the room of five people they know what to ask you Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's just my yeah. opinion. And usually when I'm going on a consulting gig, they want to know everything about me from how many teeth I have to how many children I've got, how long I've been married. And they literally want a full life uh, disclosure. And the reason for that is because some of the work that I do is uh, 
either classified or confidential or for a startup that hasn't quite got all their patents together yet. So they want to make sure that I'm an ethically, morally sound person that doesn't drink and doesn't smoke bowls and on all the rest of it. So it's one of those kinds of things. And it's the reason why mine is so long is because it's specifically tailored to the startup community. Especially those that want 10 year work histories and they mm -hmm. want to do your background check and want to, they're going to want to see the detail. Yes, ma'am. So could you explain if there's a difference in your perspective between a resume and a curriculum vitae? Um, well, curriculum vitae is a term that's used primarily in Europe. It's chronological in order instead of reverse chron chronological, and it does everything from grade school on practically. I mean, they're just incredibly detailed. Wow. They're much longer, much more detailed. That's all I know. I hardly ever see them because we work primarily in the United States. So, any other questions? I got another one. Yes, sir. Now, I've recently come from Australia, so the, the kind of requirements for jobs over there, and like the background checks and stuff, is, is somewhat different to here. Mm -hmm. What is a good way to kind of get a feel for what the company here would want versus like, you know, coming from a different background? You mean with respect to background checks? Well, yeah, like they don't have as, I don't know if it's called stringent, just the, the policy is different. Like just the way they handle stuff is um, like, um, like over here, like you know, these these background checks and, and how far they go over there is very specific. Like I was in the the finance industry, mm -hmm. so they require to do some uh, background check with the police. But I was working for insurance. They only as long as you don't have any fraud in that industry, they don't check for like if you did drugs or something like that. Over here, it seems like it's pretty common for them to do a lot more. Yeah. It depends on the it depends on the company. We have clients. One of our clients is Ben Bridge, so they'll do all kinds of testing to make sure that people who come in there aren't, including an honesty test, um, to make sure that people who come in there aren't going to walk out with jewelry. Um, so depends on the industry that you're in, how they're going to do their testing. We are also somewhat different in the United States because we have laws. There have been a lot of court cases about what can be checked. Not what can be checked, but what you can make a decision on. So you can only go back seven years um, in felony history, and the felony has to be applicable to the job, something that would be damaging in that job for you to um, be able to count it against somebody in a, in a hiring decision. So that makes companies a little bit more um, careful about what they're checking. We do do felony checks because you never know what you're going to, we do always on our, all, our, all our hires because um, you don't know what you're going to run into and there are people who have are applying for security jobs that stole from banks, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've met them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but it is a little different here because of that. So How often do your clients turn away people for their driving record? Um, I don't think we have ever had a client turn somebody away for a driving record. Now, we have had jobs where people had to be able to have valid driver's licenses to get the job. But So I imagine it could have happened if they had a problem. <laughs> but it hasn't happened in my, in my uh, company. And that's over 25 years. Any other questions? Now, I, I don't know if this one is applicable. Now, with me, I have this issue. Uh, if I'm in an area without my beanie, I'm going to get like this um, huge headache. So, where would I, how do I deal with this? Like, generally, when you go for most of these interviews, you're going to be wearing a suit or something. Obviously, you know, they're not going to be expecting a beanie. So, do they put this something yeah. as a frontal? Tell no? them. So Tell them right away. Dress up in your suit and wear your beanie and just say, I wear this because it keeps me from having headaches. Yeah, and, you know, it's all dependent on where you're going. So if I'm going to go on an interview at Microsoft, I'm going to put duct tape on my shoes so I blend in well. Um, <laughs> if I'm going to go do an interview at the bank, I've got a really beautiful three-piece gray suit with a red power tie and a nice white press shirt and blah, blah, blah. It all depends on where I'm going. It really does. Yeah, but so sometimes I, it won't even, it'll yeah, blend yeah. in with the rest of your outfit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Any others? Are we good? Are you happy? Did you learn something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Okay, let's say thank you to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. And that here is